sin was heavy my chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future I see the sun waking up in the morning, reviving dreams. I feel the wind on my back with promise, reminding me. There's a garment of praise for heaviness. There's a new song burning inside my chest. I'm living in the good that he brings get your hopes up lift your head up let your faith arise get your hopes up our God is for us he's brought us back to life
hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He's brought us back to life. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up. them do that again in just a second but I just want to encourage you guys I want to invite you into a moment of partnership with the Holy Spirit I was driving down the road this past week and I heard this song right here on the radio which first of all kudos to Chris and the team because I texted him and said you've never done it before but do this song this Sunday <laughs> so they got it together and they're doing a great job I think by the way but I what I felt in my spirit was the Holy Spirit breathing and I felt in the series that we're in right now is called The Visionary Dreamer. And we're and we're talking about the role and function of dreams and visions in our life, but we're also talking about having a vision or a dream for your life, and how sometimes the events of life and just the bumps in the road along the way will just knock the wind out of your sails. Yeah, and life, and I've said it before, life will just sometimes knock the snot right out of you. It's not really uh, you know, politically correct, but it is very accurate. Life will just blindside you sometimes. And it's hard to get your bearings when you've been sent into a tailspin. But I thank God that he never leaves us and he's always with us. And even when we're spinning and we're feeling hopeless and lost or feeling just simply frustrated. I don't, I don't have to ask for a show of hands if you've ever felt frustrated, do I? And so I love the way that he just comes in and breathes. What I, anyway, what I heard him say this past week is I want you to make this song your theme song for the remainder of this series because I'm about to do something uh, significant. You're going to see some tremendous breakthrough in some areas and some who have lost sight of dreams, some who have lost hope. I, I want you to tell them to partner with me and begin to release out of their mouths that they're going to get their hopes up again. They're going to dream again. They're going to believe again. And they're going to trust me to lead them out of the season they've been in into a new season that I have for them. So that is totally up to you to partner with him. I felt like he was saying that not only to me personally, but to me as the leader of the Grace Center. And if you're here this morning, it's for you as well, even if you're visiting. If you're watching online, we're glad to have you this morning, and we pray that it's for you as well. Connect to it, grab a hold of it, and get your hopes up, because the Bible says hope does not disappoint. Now, we've all had expectations that we misplaced, and we, left, we were left disappointed. Hope is completely different, because hope is in Jesus Christ. Hope does not disappoint, amen? So let's go through this again. And today in your spirit, reach out and connect to his spirit and say, Lord, I'm getting my hopes up. I'm going to dream again. I'm going to breathe again. I'm going to get your rhythm for my life. And I'm going to begin moving in step with you. And I, I, I really feel in my spirit something powerful is happening in these next few weeks. And it's beginning this morning. In fact, it began when I heard the song that morning. I sensed something that I haven't even seen yet. But you have to sense it before you see it. That's how the Lord moves. He'll move, you'll just get a sense, a knowing, a feeling that everything's going to be good. It's all going to work out, and he's going to move mightily in the situation. So sense it this morning, okay? If you're not sensing it yet, raise your antennas, amen? And just forget about everything that you're going on for a few minutes and let this song become a theme song for you this morning. So let's do it again, guys. So before we start that up again, just um, want the instruments just to play softly. And go ahead, keep playing. Don't drop out. But keep playing. But like Mark said, just in the participation factor, um, just proclaim that chorus. Let's just sing that chorus. 
It's not about whether you sound good or not. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with you making that declaration and coming into agreement with what God is saying through this song. So let's just do that chorus as, as a body, as a congregation. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He's brought us back to life again. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He brought us back to life. Get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, He brought us back to life. Get your hopes up, and lift your head up. Let your faith rise. Get your hopes up. Our God is for us. He's brought us back to life. I see the sun waking up. feel the wind on my back promise reminding me there's a garment of praise for heaviness there's a new song burning inside my chest i'm living in the goodness that he brings get your hopes up lift your head let your faith arise. Get your hopes up. Our God is for us. He's brought us back to life. Get your hope up. Get your head up. Let your faith arise. Get your hopes up. Our God is for us. He's brought us back to life. Father, we thank you for your presence. 
We thank you, Holy Spirit, for invitations like these into Kairos moments where you just come and invade the, the normal time and schedule of our lives with a divine moment, a divine opportunity, and in this case, a divine invitation to just come in and believe you, believe you. Even though we've been hurt before, even though we might have been let down before, when we felt like we were stepping out in faith, you always breathe on us again and bring us back to life and infuse hope back into every situation, Father. Because in the kingdom, Lord, we, we are empowered by a, re a spirit of resurrection. Nothing can keep us down when we realize that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And the Bible says we'll also quicken or empower us. So we thank you this morning, Holy Spirit, for your presence in us and your presence moving through us. We just praise you. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. If you agree with that, shout amen. Amen. Why don't you turn around and greet a couple of people, and if you don't know them, especially introduce yourself and tell them how good it is to see them today. Take a couple minutes to do that before you grab your seat for the morning. So good to see all of you today. And I said it once, I'll say it again. If you're watching online this morning, we're so glad you're with us as well. We know that you're going to be blessed today. We pray the worship has blessed you, and you're going to be blessed by the Word as well this morning. And uh, I'm glad to have all of you with us this morning. I want to uh, go through a few announcements, but they're just not just announcements for this coming week, but just some events. Uh, Grace Center is, uh, is a conference center as well, so we have... Uh, uh, quarterly events, and we have two left on our calendar this year that I want to tell you about since I have you with us. But first, real quick, next Sunday is our first Sunday fellowship. We started this this summer, the first Sunday of every month after the service. We meet in the back, and we have lunch together, and it is Italian-themed, amen? Somebody say, Mamma Mia. <laughs> So this Sunday, this coming Sunday, get with Sister Stacy and coordinate that, okay? It's Italian theme. So we've covered Mexican, which is my favorite, my all-time favorite. And uh, anytime anybody asks me, where do you want to go? If you leave it up to me, we're going for Mexican. But, and I've got all kinds of Mexican restaurants that I like. It just depends on which one I'm in the mood for. So, but anyway, it is Italian, which I, I like as well. You can't go wrong with lasagna. I think Garfield had that right. Some of you don't, don't, don't even remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we have two events left on the calendar. The first one is a month from this weekend, and it's our annual summer conference. Bishop Jamie Englehart uh, from Bay City, Michigan, he always comes through this way every summer. Uh, he itinerates this area while he's here, but he home bases out of Grace Center. He literally stays with me and Stacy that week and uh, preaches all over the place, but he's going to be with us. And this year we have uh, somebody for the first time, a first-time minister who's going to be here. His name is Jeff Turner. I'm also excited to introduce you to him. Jeff is, uh, but uh, most people who have talked to me about Jeff have told me he's one of the most brilliant minds that they've ever encountered, especially for his age. Uh, he is on a scholarly level, and he's in his uh, late 20s or early 30s, I believe. But uh, everybody has high respect and high regard for him. But I'm bringing him in because him and Jamie are going to work together. We have uh, how to study the Bible classes quarterly at the Grace Center. So this is going to be our next one. Lynn, Dr. Lynn Hiles was with us for the first one. We're going to have our next one is going to be on Saturday, the 24th from 1 to 4 p.m. And they are going to teach us how to encounter the Lord in the study of the Word. Because if you're getting into the Word and you're getting all these revelations, all they're, all they're leading up to is just knowledge of the Word and puffing you up with knowledge or making you more religious, then that's really not the point, right? The point is to see Jesus in the Word and to encounter Him and to have Him breathe on you and transform you. That's when you're actually transformed, when you look at the Word and it's a mirror that shows Jesus looking back at you and you realize you're not seeing yourself, you're seeing Him. You begin to be transformed into His same image. So they're going to teach that. Uh, there's going to be two sessions that afternoon. There'll be other churches coming over, bringing some students and some, and some folks over. Uh, then on Sunday morning, Jeff Turner is going to minister here while Jamie is up the road ministering. Sunday night, Jamie's coming back here and wrapping the event up. 
at 6 p.m. that night. And uh, there'll be some churches joining us for that Sunday night service as well. In fact, Generation Church will be here leading worship that night. And so uh, then the next event on the calendar, I'm just telling you guys this so you guys can put it in your calendar right now and make plans. And these are pretty much the, on the calendar this, this weekend every year anyway. But Convergence Conference 2019, that is an annual thing as well. We're really excited about it. We're, uh, we missed Dr. Harold Everly last year because of an unforeseen event where he had to go to Africa and do a funeral for a, a, a friend of his. And uh, they, it was a bishop who he had mentored, and they had done ministry together and build churches and Bible colleges all over Africa. So he said, Pastor Mark, if you want me there, I'll be there. But I'm just asking you, if you have it in your heart, to let me go be with that man and his, that man's family and do the service. And so we, we did. We definitely let him go. And, man, if you were at Convergence last November, it was powerful. I think the Lord led us perfectly because Dwayne White came in and, and Pastor Amanda Connor, and we just had an incredible time together. And so this year, Harold is going to be with us, and we're also going to be joined by Pastor Jay Pike uh, from the Gate Church. And then uh, <clears throat> last of all, so Mark your count, and Ashley Neely, who also leads worship for the Gate, he, he's going to be with us leading worship on Friday night and Saturday morning, and then our team on Sunday morning. But uh, we also have a new thing here. The fifth Sunday, if you go and look at your calendars, pastors are probably the only ones who look at Sundays on the calendars as you're planning your year out. Uh, I wish everybody else would, in fact, <laughs> but uh, when I look, there's usually about five, four or five fifth Sundays every year on the ca that pop up on the calendar. Well, we, what we've decided to do with those is call them the grace period, and we're going to highlight a parachurch ministry every fifth Sunday. So we're going to have another ministry, an outside ministry, somebody who travels full time or somebody who is uh, upholding or undergirding some aspect of ministry, partnering with the local church. So they're not necessarily a church themselves, but they're still doing the work of evangelism and outreach and, and helping people find transformation, which brings me to our, our next one that we're going to highlight is going to be Rise Above Ministry. So, of course, we've got my brother and his wife with us this morning and, uh, and, and Grant and Carrie as well who helped them in ministry. So we are, uh, we're going to highlight, shine the light on Rise Above. They're going to be doing the worship that morning, and they're going to be sharing uh, their hearts uh, and telling you, informing you on what Rise Above is all about. Uh, the last church, last time I just didn't get up and say, hey, this is the fifth Sunday, the, the grace period, but my, Mike and Heidi Yonker were with us that weekend, and so we blessed them, and we, they literally left for Africa a few days after they left here, and I went down there and ministered as well. And so this is the next one coming up, September 29th, so we're excited about that as well. I'm glad to have Dr. Mark Shell with us this morning. Uh, we have known each other, I guess, going back about eight or nine years now, and, uh, but he's been coming through preaching for us every year here, um, probably a couple of times a year on average, but he will actually be back for a meeting for two services in December as well. So uh, this is just a, a, an unexpected treat in the middle of summer, amen? And so you're going to be blessed by him, but what we want to do first is receive our tithe and offering this morning before I bring him up. So Grace Center, this is for you. Uh, if those of you that support Grace Center, support our vision and heart, we want to ask you at this time to, to bring your offering up. I'm going to receive a second offering today at the conclusion of the service, and we're going to bless Mark Shell with that offering. We're going to bless his ministry. So this is for Grace Center, so you can give online as well at gracecenter.tv. We also have a kiosk out in the front that you can give on as well, and that's safe too. So uh, stand up with, with me if you would, uh, and let's pray over that this morning, and then you worship the Lord with your giving. Uh, bring it up, or if you, we have some that tithe online. Go ahead. You can just go ahead and bring it up. So, Father, we thank you this morning for every opportunity to partner with you, even economically, Lord, and what you're doing. We know that it takes money to increase the kingdom and to support the work of the kingdom. And, Father, we, we love being cheerful givers because we know that gets your attention because you're a cheerful giver as well. We love that, and we thank you for it, Lord, and we just thank you for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for your generosity, guys, and for supporting everything that we do and who we are as well. We really appreciate it. We have folks uh, that support us from different states around the United States that watch us online and send regular uh, monthly support. And uh, folks from Oklahoma City that don't even go here, but they watch online and they send support as well. And I'm telling you, that really means a lot. It tells us that they believe in our vision and in our hearts. So 
uh, when you have a, somebody like Dr. Mark Shell come in, I just want to tell you, he's a teacher. He is a teacher of the Word. And I recognized real quick that sometimes the teacher's assignment is to drop a truth bomb, but it's not random. It's strategic, and in many cases, it's meant to begin a process of deconstruction in your life. <laughs> And so you have to be teachable. You have to have an open heart and a teachable heart and open mind. And sometimes if you're not, the reason those, those truth bombs are sent out there just to break that open, just to crack it open. And so sometimes we call that an offense. <laughs> People will get offended when a minister says something that they've never heard before or that shakes them to the core. He's one of those guys, though, that has that grace on his life and that assignment on his life. Now, I will tell you that it's a thankless job sometimes. Uh, people celebrate your revelation and they'll celebrate your ministry after they're in the reconstruction process. But when God is beginning a deconstruction of your belief system and he's breaking it down and getting it down to its foundation, oftentimes you'll find them offensive. And you'll say things to your pastor like, I won't come if you bring him back, you know, and to which your pastor, if he's, if he's got a solid backbone, will say, enjoy your Sunday morning at home because I'm bringing him back, because I believe in his ministry, and he's a teacher of the Word, and I love his heart to see the body of Christ think with the mind of Christ. And that's so powerful and so needed, because that's where true, true transformation flows when we're thinking with the mind of Christ. That's where we begin to walk in the victory that we've already, uh, that, that's already been given to us, amen? And so I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, open your hearts, open your minds, stay teachable, amen? Stay teachable. You're going to have a fun ride this morning in the Word. So Grace Center, let's welcome Dr. Mark Shell up. Glad that he had an opening today. Amen. Thanks for being with us, brother. Okay, there I am. Good morning. It is an honor to be here with you guys. I enjoy this house. I'm glad this date came open. It wasn't on my calendar to be here. But it opened up, and so I'm here. I believe when you go to church, you, you should learn. Amen? Yeah. And, and, I mean, everyone celebrated Jesus as a miracle worker and a healer. But the hungry called him teacher. Most people want him for his miracles. But there are are some that say, teach me, teach me. So are you teachable today? Amen. Amen. <laughs> it is impossible, say this with me, it is impossible to get offended at truth when I'm hungry. Amen. All right, let's get right into the scripture. I, I want to say back on the table, I've just got a few uh, series. Uh, this is a brand new one. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. No fear, no limits, no excuses. And many people read that in the Bible. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what the Apostle Paul said. And, and so I'm not ashamed to wear my Jesus t-shirt. I'm not ashamed to uh, drive my car with a Jesus sticker on it. That's not necessarily what he was talking about. It, it doesn't uh, uh, discount those things. But let me put it this way. In the context of what Paul was saying, and, and it's brought out in depth in this teaching, if you live in guilt, you're ashamed of the gospel. If you live in condemnation, if you're still asking forgiveness for something you asked forgiveness for 20 years ago, it's because you're ashamed of the gospel. Hmm. This will take us, it's liberating. It's absolutely liberating. I did it in a Bible study setting, and so uh, there's not a lot of screaming and yelling, it's just... I used to be a screamer, amen, and then we got sound systems, <laughs> no, not that old, Jeremiah the 29th chapter, tell somebody this is going to be good, Jeremiah 29, the 11th verse is a very familiar passage, 
very, very familiar. Many people have it on uh, placards or, or T-shirts or whatever, and, and it's so true. Uh, the Word says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I know what I think about you, so why are you worrying what someone else thinks about you? A amen. If I live in intimidation, I am choosing their thoughts over God's thoughts. Okay? And so he says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Now, can God lie? No. No. God is not biased, amen, he is not prejudiced, he is not racist, he is not gender tender, uh, isn't it amazing what society's come to, oh my God, people wait until the baby's born and doctors say, uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's been a few couples that that when the baby was born, they were getting ready to fill out the birth certificate, and they said, no, leave the gender off until it figures out what it is. Like, you're just a numb nut. <laughs> Holy smokes, Batman. How did, how did we get to these things? But see, God is not like that. Amen? God says, this isn't a male thing. It's not a female thing. It's not a Greek Jew thing. It's not a black, white, yellow man, red man thing. You are spirit. Amen? Amen? And so, he said, I'm not lying to you. I have good thoughts towards you. I've set a future out there, and I'm going to give you hope. No, he's calling me now. I, I'm going to give you hope that will be like fuel in the tank to get to that future. Amen? Now, let me ask you again, and I know it's a little rhetorical, but can God lie? Hmm. Okay, let's go back to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. The 17th chapter. I like old Moses. Old Mo. We, we all know, we all know the, the story, really, how uh, Egypt, uh, the Pharaoh, they were using the Hebrews to build their kingdom, so the enemy needs you to build your own defeat. Hello. Without your help, you can't be defeated. A amen. We self-destruct. And, and so, anyway, uh, the order was from the Pharaoh that all the male children at, at the birthing table or the birthing stool should be killed. And to kill the children, they, they simply threw them in the river. Just threw them in the river. But when Moses was m born, his mom hit him out and then put him in, in a, a basket, pitched uh, or covered, if you will, so it, would, it wouldn't sink, it wouldn't get wet inside, it would provide a buoyancy. And, and she hid it in the, in the reeds, the bulrushes. Now, what's amazing is, things that's killing everybody else, suddenly we're in the same thing, we're, we're not being killed by it. The same river that was used to kill other people is the same river that was used to perpetuate his destiny. So you don't always look at what you're going through as, oh, that's the devil doing that. No, it's not God doing bad things, but understand, what sometimes looks traumatic is an invitation to the dramatic. Okay? And, and so don't ever despise any time... You, you get to the place that you fear what you're going through. You have lost sight of your destiny. The only way you can be distracted is get your eye off the goal. A amen. 
And so anyway, Moses, uh, he, he was found by the Pharaoh's daughter, was down uh, bathing, and her servant girls were there. And, and one of them found and said, oh, look at, look at this little child. And she just loved that child and adopted him as her own. So suddenly, he becomes the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh. And, and I'm just giving you the Sunday school version here. But do you remember uh, when, when God spoke to Moses uh, at the age of 80 and, and he said, I, I want you to be the emancipator of my people from the bondage of Egypt. And what did Moses say? I am slow of mouth and slow of tongue. Do you remember that? And we always thought, well, he's just giving excuses. And we've preached hard message. What's your excuse? What you, well, you know, it, it's a little deeper than that. When, and people ask me many times, I don't see where you get what you get out of the Bible. Well, this is the way I approach the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 46 says, first in the natural, then the spiritual. Do you remember years ago they had those pictures that it was a picture in a picture. And if you looked at it long enough, you could see the picture beyond the picture. You, it was just an optical illusion. But they said, if you keep staring at that picture, you'll see the picture that's really intended. That's the way the Old Testament and the New Testament are. You can't just take a glance at the Old Testament or you'll walk away without the truth. You can't just take a scripture out of the New Testament and not study it. To know it because there is a picture in a picture. So in the Old Testament, it's the natural way. Well, that's, I see what that is. But keep looking because the New Testament is the spirit. Okay? And, and when I study, and I've said this many times, but I like to study from rabbis. And I don't mean messianic rabbis. Because if they're already a believer in Jesus, they form an opinion of the scriptures. I study after the ones that still don't believe Jesus is the Christ. Because I want raw, unfiltered truth of the historical things. That way I can develop my own opinion. Amen? Because how many times, how many times have we piggybacked on somebody else's teaching and never really understood it because if you can't stand on what you believe it was never your faith amen and so anyway uh, I, I like to study from from the midrash agada and and all that is it, it all that is is the jews understood the customs culture and time between the written text of the scripture. Okay? That's all it is. It, it was a cultural thing. It was the customs. And so when Moses was approached by God at 80, hey, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He said, I'm of slow tongue and slow mouth. We look at that and say, well, that's just an excuse. But really, when Moses had been adopted, he, he began to grow up in Pharaoh's court and uh, the historical value tells that when Moses was just a toddler, he would sit on his adopted grandpa's lap like grandkids do. And, and Moses would reach for his crown because toddlers, babies like shiny stuff. And, and all the, see, the uh, soothsayers and the seers uh, and the advisors around Pharaoh they began to speak out and said, Pharaoh, this baby is after your throne. Well, why do you think that? Because he's reaching for the crown. He must die. And Pharaoh said, well, before we go that far, let's just give him a test. Let's test him if he's just being a baby or if he has a plot against our dynasty. And so they put a bowl of hot coals and a bowl filled with jewels in front of the baby, the toddler, grabbing for everything. And the Madrash Agada states that 
it was almost like an angel appeared because when Moses reached out as a baby for the jewels, it was like an angel moved his hand to grab a coal and stuck it to his tongue. So he was telling the truth. I am of slow speech and slow mouth. Because, see, God was setting him up for victory. But a hot coal was not in his plan. What hot coals have touched your life that are you are still using as an impediment to why you don't have what you feel like you could have? Some people say, well, I was divorced. Okay. That, that's horrible, but get over it. Well, I, I, was, I was abused. Well, I was this. Everybody's got something you that should have killed you, but there's a buoyancy about you. Amen? And, and so, Moses is slow of speech, slow of mouth, but God says, I'm going to use you. Hmm. Okay. God leaves them out. Let's go to Exodus 17, if you don't mind. The sixth verse. Moses has led God's people out. And, I mean, they're all happy. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed, healed, and highly favored. Hallelujah. <laughs> that lasted for a while until... They got thirsty. Six million people started complaining to Moses. Can you imagine that? It's bad enough when five of yours go crazy. You get six million people all complaining. We want water. We want water. My God, we shouldn't have ever left. I'd be like, <laughs> go back. You, you see what I'm saying? But God says, here, Moses, I'm going to meet their need. Here's my instruction to you. Behold, I will stand before you, Mo, there on the rock in Horeb, and you will strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. That's amazing, isn't it? Six million people had their thirst quenched and no doubt filled up their, their gourds, filled up their vessels with water. So they could keep you, but then they run out of water again. Let's go to the book of Numbers. Hmm. Book of Numbers, the 20th chapter. The 10th verse. Oh, I don't know why I'm turning to it. You've got it. Hold my sign while I teach this. Now, they're all thirsty again, Okay. Just a little later, same problem, different date. Ever been there? <laughs> and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we... <laughs> God of mercy. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Next verse, please. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock. Twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the animals. Here's the problem. God didn't tell him to strike the rock. God told him, you just speak to the rock. Okay, you sure you're teachable? Here's the picture in the picture. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Can we go there, sweetie? 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Here's the picture in the picture. In the Old Testament, it was a natural rock. In the New Testament, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Christ is the symbol of the rock in the Old Testament. Okay, 
when it was struck once, that was the typology of Jesus being crucified and died once. Paul said, never having to be done again. Out of that rock in the natural flowed all the water those people and their animals would ever need for that, for that need. It, it satisfied them. It filled them. In the same effect... Peter said, we have all been blessed with every spiritual blessing that pertains to life and godliness. So when Jesus was smitten and rose from the dead, everything mankind would ever need, you don't smite the rock to get your need met. You speak to it. Let me... Let me say it this way. You don't ask for it. You thank him for it. Okay? But see, how many times, well, Mark, I've got a bright future, and God has promised me health, and God has promised me uh, uh, prosperity, and man, that's awesome. And, And his plans are far beyond what you're even thinking right now. Somebody say, Mike, I've got a good destiny. Yeah, but see, here's the problem. Graveyards are filled with people who died with hope and never saw their future. Hmm. Uh, Well, Mark, I've got a bright future. I want to see my future. I don't want my hope to run empty. What's this? How does hope become emptied when a believer knows they have a promise but they get frustrated in the wait. Hmm. Let's go look at something. Do you remember uh, God had told Moses when he called him uh, to be the emancipator? God, God told him, he said, Hey, Mo, I'm going to take you up to the land flowing with milk and honey, picture in a picture, wisdom and understanding, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Amorites, Perizzites, Girgashites, all that sounded like a pest control company, amen. He said, I'm giving this all to you. Somebody say the promised land. In the Old Testament, the natural picture is a promised land. In the New Testament, it's a promised man. See, that's the reason believers today are still trying to get to the natural Israel and build a natural temple for him to come back to in the natural. And that part of the picture is the elementary. The truth is, I am the New Testament Israel. I am the temple not made with hands. And he's not just coming back physically. He has an appearance through my life every day. Amen. 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 Now, that's not an anti-Semitic term and terminology or description and I thank God for Israel I love Israel I love Poland I love Russia you know but but we focus so much on the natural that we don't study it really deep enough to see the spirit in it amen oh okay well I just sent money to build a temple well Next time, send it to P.O. Box 5, Tulsa. Amen? <laughs> now, what's, what's this? So, M- God has called Moses and said, Man, i got plans for you, Mo. Wisdom and understanding, place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, yada, yada. Whoo! Now, let's go look at something. Deuteronomy. Uh, let's go to the 32nd chapter. Deuteronomy 32, 51. Deuteronomy 32, 51. God's talking to Moses. Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel. Next verse, please. You will not see the land set before you. You shall see the land set before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the... Now, can God lie? See, I asked you that in the beginning. Everybody's, no, no. But God told Moses, I'm going to take you to this land. But somehow, Moses, who had a bright future and a great destiny, died 
with hope. He could only see it. Can you only talk about your dream? Or do you actually expect to live it? That's hell on earth when you can see what you should have. And you can't get there. So what? Why? God, you don't lie. You said this is mine. He said, let's go back to that 51st verse, please. Because you did not respect me. You trespassed against me at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. Oh. Because you smote the rock again after I told you to just speak to it. God will not be mocked. Can I break this down? Every time you ask God to do what he's already told you, he calls it finished. You are smiting the rock. Every time you fast a meal to get God to do something, to hurry up his timing, your fasting actually is smiting the rock saying, yeah, I know what you did, but I'm going to fast another meal, and that's going to make you do it quicker. <laughs> see, we don't see it like that. How you doing, brother? Well, I've been praying for this for 20 years. You've been smiting the rock for 20 years and wondering why you don't have the promise. Is this okay? <laughs> I understand that. Once God tells you, hey, it's okay. I am the Lord that has healed you. The next time you pray about it, you are smiting the rock. So it's not God waking you up at three in the morning. He woke me up to pray about it again. That wasn't God that woke you up. That was your frustration of egotism that you haven't seen what he promised. So I've got to spur him on by praying. So it's not God that wakes you up to pray about that again. It's because I'm frustrated I don't have it yet. So instead of declaring it's mine, I'm going to beat it out of him with my works. Hello. Are you using your seed sowing? To smite the rock or plant your future? See, because some people sow seed to smite the rock. Well, if I give this, God's going to do this. Hello. You mean I'm not supposed to pray or fast? I didn't say that. I think fasting is great. I think the church messed up when they made it a, a, a religious practice. It's a medicinal thing. Hello. Because you don't just fast food. You can fast a hobby. Well, I'm in the middle of a Daniel fast. Stay on it, baby. I, I don't. But I just want to question your motives. Are you doing it to get God to do something? Or are you fasting because you are denying the thoughts that he's not doing something? So are you sowing seed to get something or to prove something? See, it's the same works we do. It's just the motivation behind those works. How many times do people start being faithful to church when they have a problem? Then after the problem gets met, poof, where'd it go? It's the Christers, the people that show up at Christmas and Easter at church. Amen? And so, and, and that's fine. If they only show up two times, that's great. But how many times have we used our church attendance out of the motivation that if God sees my faithfulness, he's really good. See, I'm smiting the rock. By trying to do a work, any time I try to mix my works into the favor of God, I am trying to manipulate my works over the works that Jesus has already done. So all, well, then I don't have to go to church. That's not what I said, Edna. What I'm saying is now when you go to church, you're not doing it to manipulate God to do something for you, you, you're doing it because you've got a bright future. 
You're not giving your tithe because you're buying something from God. Hello, he's already given all the water we'll ever need, both in this life and the life to come. It is finished. So I'm not doing things to release the water other than speaking. How you doing? Man, I'm blessed. Well, we sure been praying for you. Well, all right, thank you. Hello. I mean, what, I, what, what do we do here? Once... Once you hear from God, that's the reason, not the only reason, but that is a reason we pray. We pray till we hear from God. Well, how do I know I heard from God? God usually speaks by thoughts. You may rarely hear an audible voice. You will hear him come out of pastor or a, a teacher or singer or whoever. You know, and God can speak through his scriptures. But usually God speaks through thoughts. Okay? And, and, you know, somebody say logos. We, that's the Greek rendering of the English word word. But word, amen. But we, we read, well, that's a written word. No, if you read the whole definition of the Greek word logos, it also is defined as thoughts. And he sent his thoughts and healed them. So why do I pray to collect his thoughts? Okay, but once I have, once God speaks to me, let me give you a perfect example. And I don't know if I've shared this with you or not. Uh, if I have, just amuse me and act like you never heard it. I was in uh, Washington, D.C. just not many months ago. I was doing a men's conference. And uh, my wife never, never calls me at, service time ever she just doesn't so i'm getting ready to uh take the stage and and they're still doing some worship and and I, for whatever reason i had my phone on me and and it goes off i told pastor i said do another one whatever i'll be back in a minute so i called she's our oldest son Derek. married him off over a year ago and uh Derek's always had moles like from here down to here not horrendous, but just spots, moly spots. I would call him holy moly, amen? <laughs> That's my buddy. And uh, his little wife, she was concerned about those spots, so to ease her mind, he went to the doctor, and sure enough, they said, there's six of them, we need to biopsy. So D called me and told me what was going on. I said, okay, I'll, I'll give him a call. I told I told the, the leader, I said, I'll be right back. So on the way out of the auditorium, I didn't call. You didn't, I don't think you got a call from me, did you? Yeah, and I don't think I, I called the prayer line. Oh, that's right. I said, Father, I know how this works. What is my seed? Just like that on the way out to that car, he spoke to me what, what my seed was. Because, see, it's already done. I just need to know what to release to the earth to command the earth. Your seed doesn't command God. Your seed commands the earth. Hello. And so he already told me. I said, all right, Lord, call it done. I don't have my checkbook on me. Call it done. At that time, it was a financial seed. It was. Well, why was it a financial? Because I needed money. Hello, because see, it's not a seed till it's a sacrifice. And you know it's a sacrifice when you have to die to do it. Amen. So anyway, I, I got out to the car and I, I had this short conversation with the Lord. All right, Lord, I, you know I'm, I'm good for it. I called Derek. Hey, son. Of course, he's trying to be upbeat. Of course, he's naturally a little scared. He's a, he was a 29-year-old kid at the time. You know, he was, he was a little freaked out when they, because you immediately think cancer. I said, son, you've been around me all your life. Yeah, Dad. I said, you know what I teach. He said, yeah. I said, uh, I already prayed, and, and, and I'm sowing over this thing, so I'm not even going to pray for you. I just speak peace to your mind because you know the power of the seed. Okay, thanks, Dad. Well, who else did you have praying? I'm not against group prayers. 
Uh, don't get me wrong. Well, I was going to have you out to the prayer meeting. Okay, but just don't drag it out for 24 hours. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't believe in beg fest. I don't. And that may sound cruel and unusual punishment to the religious minded. I believe in praying. I just don't think you ought to dread doing it or wear yourself out doing it. Amen. I tell you, I won't be back till December. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, he called. I was somewhere else a couple of weeks later. He called and said, hey, Dad, get all of it back. It's all good. Yeah, son. Awesome. I acted excited for him like, oh, you're kidding me. But you know when it's going to work. How much did you know it was going to work? Because number one, God can't lie. He said, ask me and I'll give seed to the sower. Why does he tell us the seed to sow? Because that's what the earth responds to. God doesn't respond to your seed. The earth does. If God responded to your seed, then Jesus was a waste of time. Because he is the ultimate seed. So he said, I've already given you all this stuff. You sow a seed to command the earth. I don't know why I'm getting off in that, but maybe that'll help you understand. When you sow something, you have a right to command the earth. Amen. And so, so what's this? So anyway, it's all good. It's all good. And uh, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a bunch of people praying about it and, and all of that. Why? Because I just simply trust God. He told me what to do. I did it. Now, it took me years to get there. Okay? I remember when you first have a battle, boy, you know, you thank, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's done. It's done. And if the battle kept on going, you start smiting that rock. God, tell me what I need to do. Lord, and I'll do it. That's the way I was raised. Just smite the rock, smite the rock. Why do I pray again about what he said is going to be okay? Because I don't like his timing. But yet his timing is perfect. Can, can I show you something? Let's go back to Jeremiah the 29th chapter and, and rehearse that verse of uh, the 11th verse. Hurry up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you. Somebody say you. Yeah. Now here's the question. Who is the you? The people that believe God is not racist, he's not biased, he's not gender tender, God is an equal opportunity God. He said, you're the people. Now, we go around confessing that. Oh, I've got a future and a hope. But look at Moses. He died with hope, never attaining what he was promised. Why? Why? Because he kept smiting the rock. Well, what am I supposed to do, Mark, after you've prayed and God's shown you the answer? Every time that thought comes, it's not happening. Thank you, Lord, it's already done. Earth, you will yield your fruit as the seed commands it. That's it. That's all you got to say. It's a whole new mentality. You're, you're not wearing yourself out. Let's go to Jeremiah, the 25th chapter. To understand Jeremiah 29, 11, we have to understand the context. Uh, I think it's uh, Jeremiah 25, uh, the first verse. No, the 11th verse. Let me see. There's so much here to read. How much time? Oh, they're paying me by the hour, and I'm trying to milk this puppy today. What's this? Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to start. In, let's start in the first verse and read down through the 11th. We, we have to. It'll take just a minute. Okay. The word that came to Jeremiah uh, concerning 
all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to the, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. Who's he talking to? The you. You with a bright future and hope. He said, I keep telling you, but you're not listening. Well, is he getting mad? No. He just don't want you dying short of your promise. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, repent now every one of his evil way and his evil doings. Somebody say evil. Remember, picture in a picture, evil in the Old Testament is worshiping another God. What does it mean? Unbelief. You are worshiping your circumstance if you question God's timing. They said, repent now, every one of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. That's his plan. Watch. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. How am I serving another god? I don't have a Buddha anywhere around me in my house. I don't rub his belly. The Buddha belly. How do I worship another god? Somebody say worship. In the Hebrew, one of the words is prohusneo. It means to focus on something, to give it permission to grow. You can worship a problem. See, Moses worshiped the lack. And he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. Don't go after other gods to serve and worship them. And don't provoke me to anger with the works of your hands. Hmm. And I will not harm you. you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Can I retranslate that? You're hurting yourself when you keep smiting the rock. Trying to do one more work to get this thing going. One more work. To get this thing expedited. You know what the hardest part of a battle is? Patience. It's not what you're going through. Your battle is conquering in your mind. The anxiety of what you're going through. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Tell your neighbor, don't hurt yourself. Wouldn't that be nice if a pastor said, Pastor, I'm going to start a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day prayer in my home. Honey, don't wear yourself out. Now, if that's your gig, do it. I mean, but just anyway, let me get back to this. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words... Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and all these nations all around and will utterly destroy them and make them, them an astonishment, a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from the voice... Take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How long? Seventy years. Somebody say picture in a picture. And in scriptural numerology, seven is the number of completion or perfection. Ten is the number of a law or a principle, a commandment. So really the number 70 means the law of completion. You're going to go through this until it's completed or it will come back on you later. Hello. Hello. Is this making y'all that happy? <laughs> okay, I know you're listening. I'm messing with you. So, what's this? How many years? 70. 70. Now, can God lie? No. 
Okay, let's go up to Jeremiah. Uh, I, I don't have time for all of that. Yeah, Jeremiah 28. Let's see what verse we can skip to there. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Okay. Well, Mark, I'm a little depressed because I've been smiting the rock and Moses didn't get his destiny. Look at me. Picture in a picture. In the new covenant, his mercies are new every morning. And morning in the scripture is not just when the sun comes up. Morning is when you have a dawning of a revelation to bring light to a place of empty thinking. Okay? So, it's a new morning. Well, Mark, I've been beating the rock. Okay, quit. Just stop doing it. Hmm. All right. Uh, where did I tell you? Oh, the 28th chapter. I don't really want to read it. Yeah, let's start in the first verse. I'll, I'll try not to go down through all of that. Let's start in the first verse. And it happened in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, somebody say Hananiah. Hananiah. That name, see, these names mean something. I know they, they sound like goofy names, but they have a meaning to them. And, and the name Hananiah, I, I wrote this down, absolutely amazing. When you study the scripture, especially the Old Testament, find out the names uh, the names of these people, what they mean. Hananiah means to favor by petition. He was the son of Azur. Somebody say Azur. Azur means to come to one's aid as if they are a victim. So here we have a father-son mentality. Picture in a picture, Okay. We have a prophet that appeals to people as if they're being victimized for the purpose of gaining recognition to them. Okay? Well, I'll prove it to you right here. Who was from Gibeon spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people saying, now this is Hananiah talking now. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. Now, how many years did he say? Huh. I thought he said he was speaking for the Lord. But yet Jeremiah just spoke for the Lord in the 25th chapter. And God said 70 years. But then again, when you're a false prophet, you always appeal to the flesh. Okay? Because a lot of people, that, that got, term got thrown around for years. Oh, that's a false prophet. You're not a false prophet because maybe you got in the flesh and, and read somebody's mail wrong. That didn't make you a false prophet. According to Scripture, a false prophet is one that appears as knowing the end. Well, he did. He said, God's going to break the back of, of, of Babylon and you're going to get all your vessels back. That's the truth. But it's going to be 70 years, not two. So how do I know a false prophet? Because he'll always appeal to the flesh. Because if you're going through a struggle in the natural, do you want to pick one that lasts 70 years or two years? Huh, I'm in the line for two. No thanks, I'll wait. Amen. I want the two-year plan. I don't want a 70-year plan. Now, two means division. Two means witness. Okay? But what's this? Am I on the two-year plan, Mark? Are you wanting your promise so you can use it as a ministry or just give a witness? Hmm. Because if you want a ministry through your problem, you'll fulfill the law of completion. But if the flesh is activated, hello. See, that's the reason we start smiting the rock. Because we want it quicker than what it's happening. Amen? Hello? And so, hear me. 
Well, I don't know what to do, Mark. You pray. He gives seed to the sower. And whatever that seed is, I don't know what it is. He'll tell you. You sow that seed, you leave it alone. You just water it. How do I water it? Thank you, Lord, it's done. Earth, it's already been sown. Thank you, Lord. God, your timing is perfect. Well, Mark, I've got, I've got a prophecy here I've had for five years, and I'm beginning to think the guy that gave it to me, he was a false prophet. No, it doesn't mean he was a false prophet. Could mean you've been smiting the rock, and it can't happen until you quit. Do you realize we are the only delay to God's plan? We don't want to hear that, do we? It'd be easier to blame the devil. Boy, oh, devil. <laughs> but that's hard to do when the word says Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. Wow. Who am I going to blame now? Uh-oh. Amen. And so we, we get in a hurry. We get anxious. I'm a bad person because I get anxious. You're human. You're going to have these thoughts come at you. But you don't let these thoughts overtake you. Anytime you feel tempted to do a work for God. Connected to the problem you're having. Refuse it. Because if God has already spoken to you and you've already sown your seed or act of faith or whatever he said to do and you've already done it, God isn't going to tell you, come back and sow it again. Hello. Well, shouldn't I do those things anyway? Yes, but out of the motivation, it's because the water has flowed. I'm not doing it to get it to flow. Amen. So the false prophet Hananiah, you can read later in that chapter, he died that same year. He died. And guess what? Israel had to go through that for 70 years. Well, Mark, I can't do this 70 years. No, I'm, remember, it's, a, it's an optical illusion. Old Testament is the number 70. New Testament is when you have died to the anxiety, you have completed your struggle. Okay? So Hananiah dies. But do you realize, what's this? Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace? You remember that? Do you realize after Nebuchadnezzar saw them walking in the fire, and the fire didn't do anything to him. Didn't even smell like the smoke. That Nebuchadnezzar arose and declared, Anyone in my empire that ever comes against their God, your house will be burned and your land will be sold. Whew. A whole nation had to come to rever Jehovah Jireh. Yad -he -vav -he. That wouldn't have happened if the false prophet had been right. Hello? Because Israel would have already been back before Nebuchadnezzar could see Christ. God's timing is perfect. Don't beat the rock trying to get something to happen before it's supposed to. Because in all these things, well, I know he's just teaching me how to appreciate it. God, how high can you be? To th he's not trying to teach you to appreciate it. Your highest form of praise is trust. Hello? So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Learn from Mo. Moses didn't get to see his future. Oh, he got to see it. He didn't get to enjoy it. Hello? Because he smote the rock. And you remember what God said to him? Because you did not hallow me, 
in the presence of the people. What is it? Hallowed be thy name. Ooh. How do I show reverence to your name in front of people? I don't go around saying, well, I'm still praying. Hello. See, I am disdaining God's name. Do you realize, well, don't take his name in vain. Well, that does, yeah, it means don't say GD. And of course you're not supposed to say that. But how else do we take his name in vain? Anxiety. You are taking his name in vain when you become anxious over something he said is already going to be okay. Now do you see our battle? Cast down every high thing that's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Amen? Well, how do I bring a thought into obedience? You ignore it. That's, that's too simple. Hello? You, you just ignore it. You refuse to meditate on it. That's tough. Yeah, so I will give you a helper. I will not leave you comfortless. And the Spirit flows up on you. This is the reason everybody needs to use your prayer language. I don't mean out in public. Paul said, don't go around speaking in tongues to people. It, you're speaking mysteries to them. No. No. At home, in the shower, on the way to work. Anytime you have a thought, smite that rock. What are you doing? I'm ignoring that thought. You cannot ignore a thought of defeat in your own intelligence. We need help. Amen. Amen. And if you're here today and you've never used your prayer language, you have it. You've just never used it. Okay? You, you've just never used it. And, and so just start using it. Don't get in Walmart pushing, and wearing a Gray Center t-shirt. Oh, my Lord, people. No. No, 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 no. No. But in the car or whatever, just use it. Why, Mark? Because there's always going to be the voice of Hananiah encouraging you to smite the rock to overwhelm God's perfected timing. Okay? So if you're going through something and you, you, you haven't seen, you say, God, I need to know how you want me to deal with this. How do you want me to deal with it? He'll speak to your heart. Father, what's my seed? He'll speak to your heart. After that, you water it. Thank you, Lord. It's done. Earth, it's already sown. I call it. Okay? And any other thoughts in that is the voice of Hananiah trying to get you to smite the rock again. Don't smite the rock again. Amen? Did you get something today? Does that help? Well, all I'm taking away is I don't have to go to church. I don't have to pray. That's, that's not what I said. Just do it for the right reason. Okay? Do it for the right reason. Do it for the right reason. Father, I want to thank you. I think these people got a hold of what you wanted to get a hold of in them today. And Lord, if there's anybody here that's been tormented by what they're going through and that same frustration that came upon Moses when he struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it, Father, I want to thank you. That frustration, we are going to get a hold on it. We're going to rise above it because we're understanding more and more. You didn't call us to smite the rock. You called us to flow as the rock and, and declaring things that be not as though they were. So, Father, from this day forward, we're going to begin to conquer that battle in our minds. Lord, if there's some here that they say, I don't even know what seed to sow, Father... As they pray with you, from this day forward, as they pray with you, we're just learning how to pray now. We're just learning how to pray. We don't beg you when we pray. We communicate with you. And, Lord, I want to thank you this day that lives are calming down. I, I just speak that over this house, that lives just calm down and realize God's got it. His timing is perfect, absolutely perfect. And we're not going to smite that rock anymore. Mm -mm. 
The works we do are to reveal His glory, not subpoena it. I cause the anointing to flow in this house. If you're here today and you say, Mark, man, I've been beating that rock. I've been beating that rock. Now, I, I'm honest with you. I'm transparent before you if you would do the same for me. If you're here and you say, Mark, I've been beating a rock over something. And today, I'm declaring it's all changing. Show me your hands. It's nothing to be ashamed of, and we've all done it. I set on you this grace, this anointing, this peace, this impartation. I break off of you the frustration, the anxiety. Anxiety will try to come back. Frustration will try to come back. But greater is he that is in you than anything that could ever come against you. There is someone waiting to see you in this journey you're on. And Father, I want to thank you that our goal is to complete this journey. Whatever their journey may be, it may be a family thing, a relational thing, a financial thing, a recreational thing. It may be a vocational thing. Whatever it may be, it's our journey. And Father, there are people that need to see Christ in us on this journey. And they don't need to see us not hallow your name by beating the rock over it. I release peace in and over this house. Everybody in agreement said amen. Do you receive that today? Is there anyone here that you say, Mark, I've never released my prayer language? Sh show me your hand. You, ma'am? 